Hi everyone, Pastor Jimmy here. In our church we're reading the book of 1 Peter. And so I want to go over the first chapter, actually the first 12 verses of the first chapter of 1 Peter in this video. So go ahead and pause the video, get your Bible out, turn to 1 Peter chapter 1 and read the first 12 verses. I'm going to read some of these verses to you as I go through the video, but it'd be a good idea if you have read them ahead of time. So go ahead and read those verses and then come back to the video. All right, now that you had a chance to read the first 12 verses of uh, chapter 1 here, I want to just kind of explain to you what's going on, who wrote this book, who is writing it to, and what, what we kind of read in the first 12 verses of this. It starts out with Peter saying that he was an apostle of Jesus Christ. So who is Peter? Who is this? Uh, what does it mean that he was an apostle? So if you look at some people, they would say, well, he's not just merely an, an, an apostle. He's not merely just Peter, an apostle of Christ. Some believe he was the leader of all the apostles. Uh, it appears that way in the New Testament, that he was the leader. He could be uh, considered the most influential person and the most important person uh, to the early church other than Jesus Christ. Uh, he, his name was mentioned more in the Gospels than anyone other than Jesus. And so we see that Peter was a very important person. He was very instrumental in the uh, early church. Now, one thing I want to let you know about Peter, though, is Peter is not one that was perfect. If you look at Peter, uh, Jesus rebuked him more than any other disciple. Uh, we see stories where Jesus had rebuked Peter because uh, uh, he said or did something that he that was wrong. Uh, we see that Peter was the one who dared try to rebuke Jesus at one time. I mean, Peter had a uh, an issue uh, with opening his mouth before he started thinking sometimes, I believe. That's my personal opinion. Uh, Peter confessed Jesus uh, more boldly than any other disciple, though. But at the same time, Peter was also the one that denied Jesus uh, three times. Most people, if they don't know anything about Peter, they'll say, hey, he was the guy that uh, uh, denied Jesus or spoke against Jesus, wasn't he? Uh, and so people will know him because of that. But he was one that really God used to start the early church. So when he wrote this letter, when he wrote this letter, people would listen, people would pay attention, people would want to know what he was saying. And so to know that Peter is the one that wrote this letter is very, very important. He introduced himself as an apostle, an apostle, one who had the authority of Jesus Christ there. And then he wrote it to, he said, the pilgrims. Uh, a pilgrim is someone who lives as a temporary resident in a foreign, a foreign land. If you want to get to the, the Webster's Dictionary version of that, it, it's someone who lives as a temporary resident. Pilgrims are sojourners, they're travelers. Uh, pilgrims live uh, knowing that wherever they're at is not their true home. And so Peter was giving them an ideal here that this earth is temporary, this earth is not our true home. And he says right now you're dispersed, your pilgrims are the dispersion, uh, relating back to the Jews when they were in, the time, were in Babylon and dispersed from Jerusalem. But he was letting them know, we understand who you are. You're travelers in a foreign land. You have been dispersed from Jerusalem, maybe from Rome, and you're living throughout this, this providence here. But this is not your home. You must understand that this is not your home right now. And he listed out the places that they were at, and he told them that, uh, uh, that, that he knew that they were Christians. He knew they accepted Jesus Christ according to the foreknowledge of God, the nature of their election. God, God had chose them. God had knew what was going to happen. God ha had not just made a plan all of a sudden for people to come to know Jesus Christ. There was foreknowledge here. And notice that he said in the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, he was making sure they understood why they were Christians, why they had been saved. It was only through Jesus Christ. You and I can only be saved through Jesus Christ. And then in verses 3 through 5, he says, Blessed be to the Father, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. 
Peter started talking about the salvation through Jesus Christ and he got excited. He started praising God. You and I can learn a lesson from this. When we begin to think about our salvation, we can begin to praise God. We begin to, to give Him the praise and glory that He deserves because our salvation came and comes from Jesus Christ and His resurrection. And notice that He says that it begins with His mercy. His abundant mercy has begotten us. His abundant mercy that Jesus Christ showed upon all of us. And when He was raised from the dead, and when we accept Him, He gives us something that the world can't give us. He gives us an inheritance that is incorruptible. It is undefiled. Does not fade away. Look at those things. He was saying you have these promises and they're all reserved in heaven for you. Nothing this world can do can take those things away. You have that promise in heaven. How do you have that promise in heaven? Through the power of God. It was the power of God that holds us in His hand. That makes us incorruptible, undefiled. A, a promise that doesn't fade away. Our, uh, heaven is our home. And there we will be incorruptible, undefiled. All these things for us uh, once we get into heaven. And so, and we're all held together by the power of of God is how it's held together. And this promise of inheritance is what Peter is telling us to look forward to. You've got this promise uh, from God, promise from Jesus Christ that we will have the inheritance. So we're living, we're saved, continue living. And then in verses 6 through 9, he begins to tell them uh, to rejoice about this. He says, in this you greatly rejoice in verse 6, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. And he goes on to tell them about the trials and he begins to explain to them about the trials that are coming. Verse 7, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom, have not, whom having not seen you love, though, you na though now you do see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. He's saying rejoice. Why? Because you have incorruptible, undefiled uh, home in heaven being held together by the power of God. So rejoice in this. When trials come, rejoice in the fact that you have salvation in Jesus Christ. Rejoice in the fact that you have Him. And so these trials will come and they will be testing us and they will test us by fire, it says. Now many people believe that Christians should not be tested or cannot be tested. Uh, the ideal is that once we accept Jesus Christ, the, the testing or the troubles of this world just kind of bounce off of us like bullets. But that's not the case. Uh, the case is that all of us need to be tested. All of us need to have these trials. One person put it this way, and I thought this was a good explanation of why our faith needs to be tested. Listen to this. It says, our faith isn't tested because God doesn't know how much or what kind of faith we have. It is tested because we often are ignorant of how much or what kind of faith we have. God's purpose in testing is to display the enduring quality of our faith. You see, we're tested so we can understand the faith that we have, the trust we can have in God, the power that God truly does have. That is one reason we are tested. And it says here that we will be tested until we receive the end of our faith, or receiving this test until the end of our faith. The end of our faith will come when Jesus Christ returns and, return, and sends us to heaven and brings us back to heaven with Him. And we have our incorruptible bodies with Him in heaven. That is when our faith will stop being tested. Until then, our faith will be contested, or, uh, will be tested and refined in fire until then. But we have the promise to stand upon God in His promise of Jesus Christ for us. And He went on to let them know in verses 10 and 12. He, he let them know, look, I know that you're worried about the test. I know you're worried about the persecution that is coming and the persecution that's already there. 
but he wanted to assure them, look, your salvation isn't something that God just threw together at the last second. He tells them in verses 10 through 12 that this salvation was something that the prophets had inquired about, the prophets had prophesied about. It was something that they sought after. It was something that the prophets in the Old Testament knew would come, and they were longing for the day that it would come, and they were longing for the time for to see it. Salvation was not something that was just planned at the last second. It's something that God had planned from the beginning and something that God had promised through the prophets throughout. So the people had hope. The people had uh, hope here knowing that God had already had a plan and God continues to have a plan for them. And then he says something interesting. He says, things which angels desire to look into. This is the end of chapter 12. He's letting us know that, you know, the angels desire to look into the, our plan of salvation, the way that God's promises have unfolded throughout the century. It is something the angels observe, something the angels desire to know more about as they see salvation come about. And so Peter is encouraging the, the people here that he's talking to. He's saying, look, you can only have salvation through the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Only through him can you have salvation. But if you have that salvation, God holds you in his hand and there is nothing that can remove you from his hand. Your promise is in heaven through the power of God. So when those trials come, when the persecution comes, when the, the test of your faith comes, hold on to that promise knowing that you can be in, uh, uh, in undefiled and incorruptible because of God and because of what Jesus Christ has done. Rest assured that his power has you in his hand and that there is nothing that the world can do about it. Rest assured that salvation is something that God had planned from the beginning and it told through his prophets to the people. So it's not something that is new to him. It's not something that could fade away. It's something that has always been there. And know that as you go through these fires and rely upon that trust, that promise, that faith that you have in the power of God, knowing that your salvation came from Jesus Christ and that nothing can rip you away from the power of God once you have that promise of Jesus Christ and your sins have been removed. So that's the first 12 verses. In the next video, we'll look at the rest of the chapter. We'll see how we, we should love, how we should be like God, and how we can kind of live as a Christian, how we should live as a Christian and get some ways and ideals of what our conduct should be.